history returns to Europe. European Geography Europe is a land of contrasts. The majority of Europe's population lives on the aptly, if not particularly creatively named, North European Plain, NEP. The portion of the coastal plain in Europe proper is one of the world's narrowest, less than 300 miles at its widest point in Germany. But it is also one of the world's longest, stretching over 1,500 miles from the Pyrenees in southern France to the Belarusian border. And it doesn't end there, but rather expands into the European hordelands of central Eurasia. A series of broken highlands and stark mountains back the entirety of the NEP's southern border, which generates sufficient rainfall to make the NEP a lush agricultural zone and fuel a score of rivers that transect the plain. The Seine, Meuse, Rhine, Wesser, Elbe, Oder, and Vistula in particular, many of which are navigable for most of their lengths. Between ample local food production, high capital generation possibilities, and ease of movement, the NEP has had one of the world's densest population footprints, densest local trade networks, and richest populations for nearly a millennium. But there is a dark side. There are no barriers between the various river valleys. The easily crossed nature of the plain condemns the people of Northern Europe to be constantly in each other's faces. Every country's heartland is their neighbor's borderland. Civilization may come easily to Northern Europe, but so does competition. Success and security for one would mean want and instability for all others. The all-or-nothing nature of that simple fact has led to some of the world's most infamous wars being fought among the NEP powers in their efforts to carve out some security for themselves. There is more to Europe, however, than just the NEP. Peninsulas and mountains riddle the lands around the plain. The Iberian Peninsula, home to Spain and Portugal, lies south and west of France across the Pyrenees. The Alps separate Germany and France from Italy's Apennine Peninsula, and the Balkan Peninsula is on the far side of the Carpathians from Austria and Poland. Most of Scandinavia is self-contained on its eponymous peninsula. In every case, the balance of transport proves true. Mountains inhibit movement, and peninsulas limit lines of approach. The insulation that geography grants the peninsular states allows them to stay somewhat apart from the cultural, economic, and military crucible that is the NEP. That's doubly true for Europe's islands, two of which merit specific attention. Denmark's island of Zealand has been home to half of the Danish population since its emergence as a force in the 8th century. The Danes are and always have been an island people who own a peninsula rather than the other way around. A more recognizable island people are of course the English who call Great Britain home. The peoples of both islands have long acted independently of the NEP. The strongest tie that binds the peninsulars and the islanders together is a fear that someone on the NEP might actually emerge victorious from their perennial competition. Should that ever happen, the richness and might and power of the plain would no longer be spent on local feuds, but instead be available to surmount the geographic barriers that have long protected the peninsular and island peoples. Europe Today a continent riven by war is hardly how most of us think of Europe, but that is because the Europe we know has been transformed utterly by Bretton Woods. With the imposition of Bretton Woods in the American Alliance Network, the Europeans no longer needed to struggle for iron ore or steel or oil or food or spices or markets or borders. Instead of battling to be the NEP Colossus, France and West Germany could cooperate economically and focus on exporting to wider Europe and the wider world. Instead of being nervous about the NEP uniting, countries on the European periphery could, with some caution, participate in Bretton Woods' Legion trade opportunities. The Europeans were not only able to take a vacation from geopolitics, but a vacation from their own brutal history. The result, as elsewhere in the world, was 70 years of peace and prosperity, although in Europe the emphasis was definitely on the peace part. The end of the Cold War had any number of impacts on the world writ large, but in Europe it was absolutely wonderful. Europe was the primary Cold War battle line, so defense outlays were far higher there than anywhere but in the United States, the Soviet Union, and the Koreas. With the Cold War's end, resources dedicated to defense could be redirected to investment. 
A belt of states from Estonia to Bulgaria ceased being Soviet property and started down the road to European Union membership, eventually providing an infusion of over 100 million new consumers and low- and mid-cost workers. But most of all, the Cold War's end made the French and Germans sufficiently confident in a future without war that they launched their most ambitious unification project yet, a currency union, which is where contemporary Europe's problems begin. Problem one, enter the Euro. In the United States, finance is somewhat non-denominational. There are so many rivers servicing such a substantial population that capital practically grows on trees. Everyone is in the same river network and so is in the same resultant financial system. It is considered perfectly normal for a Nebraska bank to fund a Vermont mortgage or a Georgia credit union to enable credit card use in Idaho. Not so in Europe. Europe's river systems are not integrated and the differences that fact spawns do not end with different languages and identities. French trade travels on French rivers with French profits deposited in French banks where they are used to further French goals. Rivers, trade, and banks are all considered national assets. As one would expect from any such national asset, the bank's responsibilities are first and foremost to look out for the interests of the state. In 1992, the Europeans may have committed themselves to launching the Euro era, but they never united their disparate financial and banking systems into a cohesive whole. That split is the root of the European financial crisis. Once again, it comes down to the balance of transport, but this time from an economic rather than a strategic point of view. The balance of transport isn't easily swayed by political agreements, even ones as potent and far-reaching as Bretton Woods. The NEP remained the economic hub of the European wheel. But not everyone in Europe had rivers, and so not everyone in Europe could generate the surplus capital that made everything from infrastructure to education possible. Geographically less endowed areas like Iberia, southern Italy, and Greece were perennial laggards. European structural adjustment monies poured into these areas to help close the gap, funding everything from highways to olive groves. But the capacity created by this assistance couldn't hope to keep up with what the richer portions of Europe invested into their home systems simply as a matter of course. On anything remotely resembling a level playing field, well-rivered, flat, and integrated Northern Europe would always be more thoroughly educated and more productive and richer than highland, arid, and disconnected Southern Europe. But in a common monetary system, capital could flow nonetheless. Currency unity meant that the surplus capital generated in the North could be lent out to Southern economies that had no experience using it wisely at rates normally reserved for countries like Germany. Currency unity meant that Northern European exporters had unrestricted access into Southern economies that couldn't hope to compete with the Northerners' superior infrastructure and workforces. The result was the buildup of mountains of debt among southern economies, consumers, and governments at the same time that the hollowing out of southern economies made it impossible for the debt to be paid back. Far from being the crowning achievement of United Europe, the Euro was guaranteed from day one to destroy it. The ensuing calamity was as harsh as it was predictable. Less than a decade after the Euro's 1999 launch, all it took was a recession to crack the finances of many countries to pieces. The now infamous bailouts of Greece and Ireland, and the less notorious bailouts of Latvia, Portugal, Hungary, Cyprus, Romania, and Spain, have as of February 2014 collectively totaled over 600 billion euros in funds transfers and write-offs. At the time of this writing, the Europeans are not quite to the point that they can admit to the inanity of the Euro. Most serious efforts are still focused on helping a broken system limp along. Unfortunately, Europe's corporate, government, and consumer debt crisis is only one of seven challenges that the Europeans face, and it is probably their most manageable. Problem 2. Banking. The sick man of Europe. The European financial crisis has had many economic impacts, but the results have been worst in banking. Because the Europeans see banking as a national prerogative, concerns such as national infrastructure needs, maximum employment, and government budgetary stability are tossed into the mix of bankers' concerns, right along with concerns of collateral and profitability. This is encouraged 
and oftentimes actually required Europe's banks to put national directives above corporate decision making, particularly on topics like due diligence. This enables European governments to use their banks as a means of speeding investment in this or that targeted sector, to construct or repair infrastructure sooner than if they had to raise capital from private sources or taxes, or to help maintain governmental budgets in times of stress by simply directing the banks to invest in government bonds. Unsurprisingly, many of Europe's banks are state-owned in majority or in part, and even those that are not are often used as slush funds for various political interests at the local, regional, and or national level. In essence, the various governments see the financial sector as a tool of governance and use it as such. An excellent example is that of Belgian French bank Dexia. Many Belgian communities purchased shares in the bank to ensure that they would always have a strong private demand for their local debt. If a private corporation had done something similar, it would have been illegal in Europe and the United States as an antitrust violation. As the European financial crisis deepened in 2008, it became obvious that investors were shunning the bonds of highly indebted governments, such as Belgium, where the national debt was rapidly approaching the country's total GDP. Dexia did not join the exodus. Far from it. Its owners, Belgian government entities, directed Dexia to purchase even more Belgian debt, 